Great, so you've set a baseline reading speed and comprehension, and you've completed the misconceptions worksheet to pique your curiosity and prime your mind for what you're about to learn. Soon, you'll understand why these steps were so important. So, let's dive in and start by improving our memory. To understand why memory improvement should be done before speed reading, I want you to imagine a bucket. Above that bucket, you have a funnel, and pointing into the funnel right now is your regular average garden hose. It's no problem, right? Now, imagine we switch out that garden hose for a fire hose. Big problem. The funnel is immediately overwhelmed, and it's probably blown to smithereens. Water starts spilling everywhere, and in about a nanosecond, the bucket overflows too, and it's not long before you have to shut the water off completely. If we take this metaphor for our learning process, it's easy to understand why we have to first upgrade the bucket, and then the funnel, before we finally upgrade the hose. You see, the hose itself represents your input speed, or your reading speed, whereas the funnel represents the combination of two different types of memory, your working memory and your short-term memory. You may have heard the term working memory before, since people often incorrectly use it as interchangeable with short-term memory. It's best to explain the difference clearly, though. Working memory is the type of very short-term memory that allows you to remember what I said at the beginning of this sentence so that you could connect it all together and understand the complete idea and then analyze it at the end of the sentence. Like the name suggests, working memory is really for working with and understanding new information in real time. It's actually a lot less about memory than about understanding and analysis. One last point on working memory, our brains do use several different types of buffers to work with the various types of information. This basically means that words, ideas, images, and scenes, they don't all use the same path to get to the short-term memory. But we'll get to all that and why it's important a little bit later. So, what is that short-term memory then? Well, once you've used your working memory to process, understand, and interact with a piece of information, your short-term memory is what keeps it in your mind for about 15 to 20 seconds. This might seem like a really short amount of time, and it is. That's why, for the majority of the course, we're going to focus on improving the connection all the way from your working memory to your long-term memory. This is because if you do a good enough job creating those short-term memories that'll stick till you get to the end of a page or an article, you'll only need to use some simple review techniques and regular maintenance to keep things in your long-term memory, where we eventually want all our new information to remain. This means that right now, our working and short-term memory are the primary bottlenecks. Without the right infrastructure and base skill set to improve these two types of memory, speed reading is pretty useless even impossible. This is why I personally failed twice before reaching Anna's course. It's also why a lot of people think that speed reading is a myth, because most speed reading courses want to get you in and out as quickly as possible, and to do that, all that's necessary is to give you the illusion that you're reading faster. If you've ever played around with some of those speed reading applications like Spritz, or tried out the method in Tim Ferriss's popular article, Scientific speed reading, how to read 300% faster in 20 minutes. You'll know that reading faster is not that big of a challenge until you realize that you likely comprehend nothing. Even Ferris himself is unable to offer any advice for this, besides urging people not to be too concerned with comprehension or retention. It'll somehow magically catch up. <laughs> but comprehension and retention, or actually understanding and remembering what you read are the major challenges to speed reading that most people fail to overcome. Don't believe me? No problem. Let's read an article together at my average speed.
As you can see, reading this quickly is actually not nearly as challenging as you might think. Like Tim Ferriss, I could teach you to do it in 10 to 20 minutes. Storing memories at this speed, however, is a totally different challenge. How many of you comprehended what you were reading? How many of you actually remember it? And better yet, how many of you will remember it one hour from now? To put it bluntly, this is why we need to upgrade your memory first and foremost. Unfortunately, academic institutions don't teach sophisticated memory or learning techniques. We're expected to just remember things without ever being taught the proper skills to store a large number of effective, high-quality memories fast. This means that most of us, when we have to learn new information, are subjected to rote memorization or very basic mnemonic devices. If you remember the phrase I before E except after C, or you ever use the mathematical mnemonic PEMDAS, you know exactly what I'm talking about. These methods are hugely effective for children learning simple things like mathematical conventions, but they don't allow us much flexibility with the information, and we become highly dependent on them. For example, how many of you can tell me what the 11th letter of the English alphabet is? Honestly, even I can't do it because I learned that using a song. So I only know that information chronologically. And like most of you, I have to sing through the song in my head to arrive at the answer. By the way, it's K. <laughs> Furthermore, what if you had to memorize much more complex information, such as the chronological order of historical events or all the ligaments in the human body? For that, you need an entirely new set of memorization skills, ones that give you a richer understanding of the material way beyond songs or acronyms. Fortunately, this is not boring stuff at all. This is a general theory on how to improve learning, not just for reading, but also for meeting new people, learning new skills, and so much more. While we work our way through the course, you'll be able to apply these skills in your daily life, and that will keep you engaged, motivated, and thirsty for the next set of skills. And that by itself is a hugely important aspect of accelerated learning. If you don't use it, you literally lose it. And as we'll learn, it's very hard to learn new things unless we're able to generate some interest and passion around them. Personally, I believe that it's easier to use a technique if you understand how it works. This is why whenever I teach someone to drive a manual car, I always make sure that they understand what's happening when you move the gear shift and what the clutch actually does. And so, while I'm certainly not a cognitive scientist, I want to give you a very basic explanation of how your memory works. This is important because it'll help you understand why we do some of the strange things that we're going to do throughout this course. It's all linked to the actual inner workings of your mind, and it's all based on neuroscientific research. So first and foremost, let me say that your mind is made up of about a hundred billion tiny little cells called neurons. These are basically electrically excitable cells that process and transmit information using electrochemical signals. These signals are a lot like the electrical signals firing between different parts of your computer, except in your brain there are no wires. Instead, we have synapses, and those are specialized connections between the neurons. I don't want to get too technical here because this stuff is definitely over my head, and in fact, the way our memory works is not yet fully understood, even by leading cognitive scientists. But basically, memories are created when your brain sends neurotransmitter signals to two neurons at the same time. This strengthens the connection between those two neurons, and presto, you have a new memory. This is an important point to make because it shows that the creation of memories requires connection between two neurons, or a connection to existing neurons in your brain. The other thing you need to know is that when this happens over and over again, the cluster of neurons and their synaptic connections become something called a neural network. From artificial intelligence research, we know that neurons work better in these types of clusters. This means that when several neurons fire together, the signal is actually amplified. 
That's why it's so crucial to store memories in several connected neurons and to further connect them to the memories that we often use. Now, this is where it gets really important. Your brain has these two incredibly powerful parts called hippocampi, interestingly named for the fact that they look like little seahorses. You have one hippocampus for each hemisphere that, among other things, regulates how memories are created. As far as we're concerned, the most important function of these hippocampi is to determine what's worth remembering. There are a lot of criteria here, including novelty, but perhaps one of the most important criteria for the hippocampi is to determine that something is relevant based on existing memories in our brains. The net effect of this, as we hinted before, is that the more connections there are to a piece of information, the more likely your hippocampi are to determine that it's worth storing. But what about forgetting things over time? Well, our brains have a capacity of about 2.5 petabytes. That's plenty of room for all of the things we want to super learn. So why does it seem like we're constantly forgetting things? Well, as researchers have recently found, our brains actively forget memories in order to remain efficient and healthy. Our brains, though they're only 2% of our body mass, take up 20% of our energy consumption. So keeping them efficient is a huge evolutionary advantage for our bodies. In fact, forgetting irrelevant information is so important that there are numerous mechanisms in the brain used to forget things based on whether it determines it should be forgotten because of trauma or just because it's not useful. In some of these processes, the hippocampi are at play again, and they're always searching for relevance and applicability. At the end of the day, this means that having many connections to our memories has another massive benefit. It makes it less likely for them to be removed or to fade away. To give you a metaphor of this, I want you to imagine two roads. One is a six-lane highway connecting eight medium-sized towns, and another one is a country road connecting one house to another. Now imagine that the state budget only has room to repair and maintain some of these roads, not all of them. Which road is more likely to receive regular maintenance and improvements? Which is more likely to be neglected and erode away? This, for example, is why you rarely forget information like your childhood address, even if you haven't used it for years and years. Because there are so many connections and stories and experiences around that piece of information, your brain determines that it's critical and will never erode it away. Knowing this can benefit us tremendously. The process of superlearning necessitates that we create more connections to the information we want to learn. This way, the mind is forced to remember it like we would remember everyday information that we use. Think about how children learn, for example. They pick up a spoon and they play with it time and time again. They eat with it, they drop it on the floor. All the while, they're building connections and an understanding and a history around that spoon. What it does, how it feels. Finally, they learn to remember the sound, the name for it. Spoon. This is also why writing things down or any type of mnemonic even the basic ones, is a useful tactic for learning. You see, you're simply creating new memories in the form of stories or sentences and tying new information like the order of operations, first, outer, inner, last, in mathematics, to a word that you already know, foil. But what about in the adult brain? Of course, there are different requirements for adults to learn than for children, right? Well. First and foremost, I want to dispel the myth that children's brains are somehow better at absorbing new information or that they have a higher neuroplasticity. Recent studies have actually shown that this is simply not true. The reason that children seem to learn with more ease is that they're learning literally every waking hour and all information is new and exciting information for them. Furthermore, research shows that our brains do play by the use it or lose it rule. Most adults lose the ability to learn rapidly simply because they settle into their day job and they stop learning in the volume 
that they used to as children, not because their brain chemistry or neuroplasticity have actually changed. With that said, there are definitely some requirements that are unique to adult learners. In fact, in the 1950s, one of the leading researchers in adult education, Malcolm Knowles, published a book around the five requirements for adult learning. Now that we understand how the brain works a little bit, I don't think any of them will surprise you. They are, number one, self-concept. Adults are self-directed and independent. They need to take an active role in creating their learning experience. Number two, the role of experience. Adults have a growing reservoir of experience, including mistakes, that is a critical resource for their learning. Number three, readiness to learn. Adults are most ready to learn things that are pertinent to their daily life situations. Number four, orientation to learning. Adults respond best to learning that will be immediately applicable. Adults are more problem-centered than subject-centered in their learning. And number five, motivation to learn. For adults, the motivation to learn is internal. This means that they must know why they need to learn this new information. So, do you understand why we've done some of the things we've done in the last few lectures? Explaining why you need to know things, making you set your own goals and schedule your own learning sessions, in general, you can leave it up to us as your instructors to make sure that this course follows along with all five requirements for adult andragogy, as well as to conform to the formula that best suits your very picky hippocampi. But, as we said before, we can go far beyond this. Beyond just setting up the materials in a way that's interesting to you and your brain, we can actually build synaptic connections or memories in a much more efficient and rich way. And that is what we're going to be learning in the next lectures. But first, make sure to check out the PDF syllabus because there's a good amount of homework and a ton of optional reading materials on everything we've learned in this lecture. Soon, we're going to learn how to trick the hippocampi into viewing things we want to learn as novel, exciting, relevant, and totally worth storing in our short-term and long-term memory. However, before we get there, we need to focus on the working memory, that funnel that we were talking about earlier. This is pretty exciting because we can actually start to see some huge gains to our memory capacity very quickly by understanding how to take advantage of our working memory properly. Have you ever wondered why in every country in the world, phone numbers are broken up into three to four digit clusters? or why your credit card number has those spaces between the numbers. This phenomena is intentional, and it's because of a powerful little brain hack called chunking. You see, for most people, the working and short-term memory can only remember sequences of seven plus or minus two pieces of information, meaning that three to four pieces of information is easy for just about everyone. That might not seem like a lot, but remember that your short-term memory is, like we said, just the temporary stage that information passes through for about 10 to 15 seconds before going into long-term memory, assuming that the hippocampus deems it's worthy. It's also worth noting that some people can remember larger chunks of information. If you're curious, you can try to remember chunks of up to seven, eight, or even 10 numbers to see where you get stuck. From there, you know how small of chunks you need to break things into. The chunking system is very good because it's an entry-level mnemonic technique. It's not only much faster and easier to learn and play with than some of the heavier visual memory techniques we're going to learn later, but it's also a critical element of the overall technique. This is to say that even after we teach you the methods to remember things way more easily, you're still going to be chunking details or memories into groups of three or four so that they can better comply with the requirements of your short-term memory. Sure, we could train your short-term memory to hold a larger number of items, but that would only slow you down and place a larger cognitive load on you. At three to five items, there is no slowdown, and so it's preferable to work in this range. Furthermore, by chunking groups of items into one entity, we can stack five chunks of five objects each into our working memory 
and effectively store 25 items in our short-term or working memory without any cognitive overload. Because of this massive advantage, you'll notice that all of the world's top memory athletes use systems that are based on chunking combined with powerful visual and spatial memory techniques that we'll be learning later on in the course. The other nice thing about chunking is that it works with just about everything. Take a sequence of numbers or a couple pieces of information, for example, brown dog, tall fence, lost frisbee. You can even try to chunk information about people into neat little bundles. It might seem strange, but remembering that information in chunks is actually much easier than if it were to be put all together, the brown dog who saw the tall fence where the frisbee was lost. Chunking is a well-documented psychological phenomenon, and we've provided some further reading on it in the PDF syllabus in case you're interested. In the next lecture, we're going to give you a worksheet to show you the power of chunking and to practice this foundational skill a little bit. While we haven't gotten to the really incredible memory techniques yet, you'll already start seeing some improvements if you start breaking information into chunks, and this skill is going to come in handy later. All right, guys, I want to demonstrate to you the power of chunking and really how effective a skill it is because it is something that is going to be coming up over and over. Even when we learn the more powerful mnemonics, we're going to be using chunking. And so in order to first demonstrate visual memory and how chunking can benefit that, we're going to head over to Dr. Lev's Key to Study blog, and we've linked you up to this game called the Short-Term Visual Memory Training Game. And I've set it to eight symbols here. You'll start out at four, but what you want to do, and you'll see we're also at novice, what you want to do is you'll be flashing symbols on the page. And you'll very quickly realize that if you don't use chunking, it's going to be very hard to recognize how many S's and how many T's. Let's see that again. Let's see how quickly that goes. Okay? Now, Soon enough, you'll realize, once you get past four or five symbols, you'll realize that you need to chunk them. And the strategy for beating this game is to chunk the symbols, okay, into quadrants or into areas. And then you don't have to immediately count in that split second that they show. But what you do is you create the chunks. And then in your mind, you have all the time in the world to go through the chunks and say, okay, what did I see in the top left quadrant? Well, I saw an S and an S and a U. Okay, on the right I saw. And then you can add them up. And this game is very, very hard without chunking, but if you use proper chunking technique, you'll immediately realize how powerful it is. And then once you get a little bit more advanced, you don't have to chunk in quadrants. You can just take clusters. Okay. The next thing that I want to show you guys is another game that'll demonstrate the power of chunking. Now, this is the 20 random word generator on the Key to Study blog. Ideally, you'll be using this eventually once you've learned some of the other hardcore mnemonics. So ignore creative visual markers and word linking and all that stuff for now because we haven't learned it yet. But what I want you to do is try and play this game without chunking once. Try and remember all 20 words. Okay, and then you can kind of minimize the page or you can pull it off the screen and try and see how many words.
By now, you understand a lot about how the different types of memory work and what's required for adults to learn new information. Maybe you've even started thinking about ways to adhere to these protocols and ways that you could change your learning process to maximize your success. One such strategy is an important practice called dual coding. Remember how we learned that the brain has different buffers for working memory depending on the type of information it's interacting with? Well, in dual coding, we try to get different types of working memory buffers to activate at once, thereby increasing the chances of retention and storage in long-term memory. In the coming lectures, we're going to emphasize how important it is to look at a text or a piece of information from different angles, to ask different types of questions, and to use different senses such as vision and smell, or even emotion, to engage with the material in different ways than you normally would. And this is why. This is also why we advocate a style of learning that I like to call brute force learning. This is a term that has been lifted from hacking, where a hacker will attack a server by trying thousands or even tens of thousands of passwords in the same form rapidly, often with a few different machines or different angles. What does this have to do with learning, though? Well, as we've just established, the most successful learners attack a piece of material from many angles and perspectives. They read about it, they check out contrasting opinions about it from different sources, they jot down some notes, they teach a few friends about it, they try it out themselves, they look at pictures, you get the idea. All of these different approaches and methods reinforce the learning, connecting it to other types of memories such as experiential memories and overall they strengthen the neural network associated with what you're trying to learn. My point is that if you want to learn effectively, at some point you'll need to get your nose out of the book and engage with the material in different ways, from different angles that appeal to you and apply to the material at hand. A great example of this, by the way, would be to try and explain to some of your friends what you learned in the last few lectures about your memory and about chunking. By teaching this information, you force your brain to look at it from a different angle, to deconstruct it, to form it into your own words, and then to present it in a compelling way. As they say, something once taught is something twice learned, and we would absolutely love to see you get out there and share what you've learned with your friends so far. Since you, as an adult learner, need to be self-directed and make decisions about your experience in order to learn effectively, we'll leave a lot of this stuff up to you. Though, in the coming chapters, we will give you lots of different exercises to choose from and ensure that your learning is very multidimensional.